Noah Meir, the director of the Israel Action Center at JCRC, uh, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington, which is the public affairs arm of the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington. Okay, and uh, first question, what is the biggest culture shock coming out as an Israeli uh, coming to Washington, D.C. in America? So the funny thing is, um, I'm a dual citizen. I was born here, but my family's all Israeli, and I am. I first see myself as Israeli, first Jewish, then Israeli, and then American. And even though I wasn't expecting any culture shocks, there were plenty. Um, I've I've lived outside of Israel. I've worked with Americans um, my whole adult career when I was in Israel, and still coming here uh, as an adult was very different. Um, I think the first shock was from the abundance of everything and the prices and also from the mentality. Um, Israelis don't tend to plan and sort of, you know, roll with the punches and here it doesn't work that way. So I think that was the really first shock was the just how you have to plan everything ahead of time. Even a coffee date needs to be planned two weeks ahead. Um, and so what is your favorite part about living here in the nation's capital? Like, what are some of your favorite things you like to do on the weekends and things like that? Do you want me looking at you or here? Oh, uh, you could just look at the Okay, camera. sorry, I wasn't sure. No problem. Do you want to ask it again or is it fine? Yeah, uh, okay. yeah um, I'll ask, uh, let me ask, let me ask it again. Um, so kind of what, what's like your favorite part about living here in the nation's capital area? Um, what are some of the, your favorite things you like to do on the weekends? I love living here, not only because I was actually born in this area, but because it really is, um, I think, one of the most beautiful cities in the States, and definitely the most special, the specialist one, uh, the most special one, sorry, my English is not so good. Um, originally I'm from Jerusalem, so from living in the capital of Israel to living in the capital of the United States to me makes a lot of sense. Um, I think Washington, D.C. is both beautiful and has so much history to it and just this past weekend I went to see the cherry blossoms and I get excited like a little kid every time that I go. Never get sick of it. And so um, tell me a little about your current position as uh, Director of Israel Action Center at the JCRC. Um, what is the most challenging part of your job and also what is the most rewarding? I've been the director of the Israel Action Center for the past, uh, over the past year. Uh, I started in January of 2014 and I consider myself extremely fortunate to have found this position. The JCRC is an incredible organization. Uh, we are one of the only, if not the only JCRC that actually has an Israel Action Center. It was established uh, a couple of years ago. And I get to bring Israel, and I get to bring my passion and my, my expertise, which is, is really bringing Israel to the community, um, to the Jews, and also trying to reach out to the non-Jews. and. The most rewarding is the, mo the most challenging is the most rewarding and vice versa. Uh, it's really trying to bring Israel to people who wouldn't otherwise hear of Israel or have a negative or sort of are on the fence and showing them that it's so much more complicated and there's so much more to it. And even the community here that is really uh, overall from what I've met is very pro-Israel. There are so many different ways of being pro-Israel, and it's very important for me to get that message across and for people to understand just because you don't agree with the prime minister or with his policy doesn't make you any less pro-Israel. There are people in Israel that didn't vote for him and are very pro-Israel and vice versa. And one of the messages that I feel that I really carry when I go and speak at synagogues and I feel that it, it catches the community by surprise is I say, you know, do all of you agree with everything that America does? And everyone's, of course not. Does that make you not, does that make you anti-American or not pro-American? Then they look at me and they say, oh, I, I never thought about it that way. So yes, being pro-Israel doesn't mean blindly supporting it, but it means recognizing and advocating for the right of a Jewish state to exist. Um, but beyond that, if, as they say, two Jews, three views, two Israelis, 40 parties. So there's, there's definitely place for, for, discussion and debate, but it's very important for me that people will know that there are so many different voices and regardless of who wins the elections or doesn't win the elections, it's, it's, there's so much more to it than that. Um, and kind of on, that, on the theme of what, you're, what you're, we were just discussing, how can the Washington area Jewish community uh, engage more positively with Israel regardless of political or ideological views or affiliation? Um, is, it, is there anything like you're working on the Israel um, Action Center right now or any, any, any projects or anything to try to engage more positively with, uh, with Israel? Um, it's an excellent question. These days, you know, I think Israel probably has always been a controversial issue, maybe now just because it gets more media attention but and because of the current relations between uh, the Prime Minister and the President. 
it feels that that it's really a hot potato that some people don't even want to touch. Um, and we're trying to go about that and reach out as much as we can. One of our Hallmarks uh, program uh, that was initiated by the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington and we've partnered with them is a program that we do uh, called the Israel Engagement Fellowship. And it's reaching out to teens between the ages of 16 to 18 from all denominations, Reconstructionist, Reform, Religious, conser uh, Orthodox, Conservative. And we do six sessions with them. We just finished our third cohort. And the idea is to bring Israel to them and to make them feel comfortable to have a safe place to have a conversation, a candid conversation about Israel. And what we want to do is we're trying to address what's been going on, which first of all is on campuses, unfortunately. And you see also on campuses the activities against Israel. Some, a lot of that sometimes can include also Jewish students. And sometimes that can happen because they feel that they weren't given A, the tools, and B, all the information. So we say, let's, let's have a conversation. Pnina uh, Genyahu, the Shlichad Federation, and myself, we're both Israeli. And we talk about Israel, we're Zionists, we're not, we're not claiming to be objective, we're, we're coming with a huge love for Israel, but we want to share that love for Israel and show them there's a way to love Israel and the people of Israel without supporting uh, necessarily what the government does. And, and some people do support it, and that's also fine, but we really want to try and have this space place, uh, sp safe space and have this conversation. And for me, my vision and my dream is, to have that conversation not just with teens. I would love to get out to the more progressives. Um, I, I go to the APAC conference every year, and this year for the first time I went to the J Street conference. And really, JCRC is a very, very centrist uh, organization, and my goal as an Israeli is to speak to everyone and anyone who's willing to listen to hear. Yes, there are certain, true, there are certain um, what I call truths in terms of to, um, there, there must be a Jewish state and we must recognize that Israel has a, a, an, a it sounds almost ridiculous to say that we have a right to exist as a Jewish state, but unfortunately these days nothing is obvious. As long as that's our starting point, yes, then we can have a conversation and we can talk about the different issues and the different difficulties that Israel faces. But Israel is a democratic country, pluralist country that deals with challenges like any other one. And I wish, I, I really, really aspire to broaden the conversation and get to a larger crowd. And I actually want to get, we say in Hebrew, Dafka, I, I, I want to get especially to the ones who are the more progressives and who are less likely to engage in the conversation. Because, I mean, it's nice to preach to the choir, but that's not what we're looking for. We want, again, want broaden our base and bring people in. And um, you served for three years in the Foreign Relations Department of the IDF as the head of the North American desk, uh, holding the rank of major. Um, and as a captain, you served as a spokesperson for the IDF and as a deputy head of the Military Strategic Information Section. What do you see, um, I guess it's, it's sort, of on, um, sort of, again, on the topic that you were discussing, maybe reaching out to more progressives or people who might um, not necessarily be supportive of, of Israel and the IDF, but what do you see as the biggest misconception about the IDF that you would kind of like to get out, to get out there, um, that people, um, you know, it's, that's kind of maybe out there is like maybe a, a, a negative perception maybe about the Israel Defense Forces that isn't really uh, reality, um, and you would like to try to uh, maybe change that those misconceptions about the idea. First of all, thanks for giving me the opportunity because um, I've been engaged in Israel advocacy for the past decade. It's my passion, but it's also my career. And the most important thing for me is for people to understand that the Israel Defense Forces are comprised of men, young men and women, officers, people such as me. Um, the unfortunate, uh, I don't even want to give the negative uh, associations that are given on the media, I don't want to even repeat them here. It's the first thing you learn as a spokesperson is don't repeat a bad question because then that's the message that goes around. But the, the things that are being claimed against the IDF, the comparisons that are being made, we're, we're approaching uh, Yom HaShoah, the, the comparisons that are being made between the IDF and um, let's say darker ages are just, um, it's, it's, it, for me, it's horrifying because it's not only, you know, people say here it's one of the most moral and ethical armies in the world, but it really is. I served there for over a decade. I know that when we get recruited, every soldier, every young soldier, 18-year-old, gets this pamphlet of the moral and ethical code of the IDF. The policy is a policy of teaching you to re the highest regard for human life. Does that mean that things don't happen, that there aren't soldiers who abuse the system, and that there aren't wrongdoings? Of course there are. There aren't any system. 
but I am so proud to have belonged to the IDF. I uh, just recently uh, completed my service um, as a major, and I really could not have been prouder wearing that uniform and belonging to something that I feel um, represents not just the state of Israel. I really do feel that it's a, a military of the Jewish people, and that it's and that its mission is to defend the Jewish people. Again, it doesn't mean it's perfect. It doesn't mean that things don't happen. But what I wish that people could see is beyond the headlines that they're seeing on CNN, beyond the pictures that they're seeing in the New York Times. I wish people could see the, the human faces behind the idea of soldiers, men and women such as myself, that really come with a passion and and a desire to you know to, to stand up for their country. And, and uh, uh, you recently participated in a panel discussion, I believe it was at Northern Virginia Jewish Film Festival, and I, I believe you were at the Washington Jewish Film Festival as well, I'm not sure about It was that, that one, yeah. But uh, there was a documentary um, Beneath called the Beneath the Helmet, From High School to the Home Front, kind of um, uh, doc, you know, documenting uh, the, the lives of uh, Israeli soldiers uh, as part, you know, going into their service. I was just wondering um, if you, uh, how was the uh, you know the panel discussion? What uh, what are your thoughts um, on that movie? So it's an it's an excellent segue because as I was talking about how important for me it is that people see the idea of soldiers and the men and women for who they are for being people and and, and humane people um, with the highest regard for human life. The thing that came into my mind was the movie Beneath the Helmet, which was produced by uh, Jerusalem U, and they're going around and showing it um, around really across the U S. Uh, not just the U.S. Uh, I was fortunate enough to participate in two panels with that movie. Um, also, we were we showed it. Uh, no, sorry, scratch that. Sorry, we showed a different movie. Never mind. Okay. Well, that's okay. From the beginning. I can I can I can I can edit it. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Not a, no, not not a problem. Okay. I can edit sorry, it. I was confused with a different movie that we showed our teens, but it wasn't it. Sure. No problem. Good. good. So Beneath the Helmet is an excellent, excellent movie. It really humanizes um, the people of Israel and spe specifically the IDF soldiers. It shows the human faces behind it, and it shows that the IDF, you know, before it's even a military to protect Israel, it's a military to protect ourselves in the sense of being human to one another, looking out for one another. It's really a melting pot, and you have different Israelis that otherwise wouldn't have given each other the time of day find themselves in the same system and, and not only find themselves together, but find themselves helping out one another. And, you know, they say that the uh, Israel of Mizrahi and Ashkenazi, what made it really, those lines dis, um, almost disappear, is the fact that everyone serves in the IDF. So everyone is mixed together and it really brings uh, the people of Israel together. And um, I think that that's something that you can get a glimpse of in Beneath the Helmet, and you can really see these human faces. You see different stories, uh, a lone soldier from Switzerland. You see an Ethiopian soldier who's struggling because he needs to support his family. You really see all different kinds of stories. And, I mean, I've already watched it three times because I participated in three different panels, and every time I, I tear up and I, 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 I get touched just by watching it. Now, your father is the former Israeli ambassador to Rome. Uh, what was it like living in Rome uh, as the child of an Israeli ambassador? Was he did your homework? I wasn't. He served there when I was already in the IDF. Oh, okay. that was the one posting okay. I wasn't taken to. Okay. But I got to visit him ten times, and it was beautiful. <laughs> so, what, what, how was Rome? What was Rome like when you were when you visited your father there? Rome was absolutely gorgeous. I was very fortunate. I got to visit my parents while they served there for five and a half years, um, and it was also amazing to see the respect that they had for my father as an Israeli ambassador and um, to see that, you know, again, in Italy there's also a lot of criticism of Israel, but I, from what I could tell through my father's eyes, they, he really managed to get to the to the highest echelons there and there was a, a candid conversation about Israel and, and to have the politicians at the time on Israel's side and that was very heartwarming. And the food is fabulous. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, oh, I guess speaking of food, do, do you miss like uh, Israeli street yes. food and yes. ability to get like a good falafel anytime? Um, okay, this is we need to we need to talk about something. <laughs> Israeli food is not about falafel or shawarma or even hummus, even though we have a lot and it's great. Israeli food is just. I just came back from a restaurant here in Northern Virginia. The food here is good. I'm not saying. But the freshness and the vegetables, and if I'm talking about an abundancy in everything in America, I think the one thing that Israel has more abundance in is its food, especially when we're talking about vegetables and salads. And I wasn't that much of a healthy eater before I moved to America, but now I miss it immensely. Um, I really think even 
I, I used to staff birthright and the kids used to say, where should we get shawarma? Where should we get falafel? I said, forget that. Just go into a restaurant, order a salad or a sandwich or a pasta. It'll be the best you've ever had and it never fails. <laughs> Well, very good. Um, and kind of on the theme of like uh, comparing um, Israel food or culture to America culture, how, how is the dating and social scene in D.C. compared to Tel Aviv? I asked you to get personal. <laughs> <laughs> Did not anticipate that. If you don't, you don't, if you, you don't I want to. to okay. I want to. <laughs> I just need to think. Can I pause for a second? Yeah, or in general. Uh, no, no, I'm very happy with the question. Okay, I just want okay. a second. <laughs> Okay, the dating scene is difficult regardless of where it is, from my experience, if it's Tel Aviv and if it's DC, it probably goes the same for all around the world. Um, I won't start comparing the Israeli men to the American men, although that could be a whole interview in itself. Um, as someone who is recently single, I will say that it is a challenge to be back in the dating scene and in, te and in Tel Aviv, in DC especially. Uh, on the one hand, you have a lot of people who are in government and that's something that really speaks to me because that's what I've been doing for the past uh, decade, uh, working in sort of government relations. And on the one hand, you have uh, people very much engaged in those topics. On the other hand, they're very much engaged in that, so you feel a bit less time for, for the dating scene. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting, and I will say that it is a challenge, maybe even bigger of a challenge than being the director of the Israel Action Center. <laughs> oh, very good. Uh, okay, well, last question. Well, this on kind of a, a bit of a humorous note. Um, I, used, I used to work at a Variety Magazine out in Los Angeles, oh. and I, I wrote, occasionally wrote book reviews for them. And one of the books I reviewed uh, for Variety was a book titled Regret the Error, How Media Mistakes Pollute the Press and Imperil Free Speech by Craig Silverman and Je Jeff Jarvis. And in doing my research on this, uh, for this interview, I came across um, a quote uh, in the book from the Sacramento Bee, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but um, here's the quote. Uh, in some editions Wednesday, this, this is the error in the correction. In some editions Wednesday, a quote with a page A1 story about Israeli troops in the Gaza Strip incorrectly described Israeli military spokeswoman Captain Noah Meyer as a senior Hamas leader. Really? Yes. <laughs> Wait, so, you have to explain that to me again. I missed that. That was actually, is that? Yes, in the Sacramento Bee, uh, one of the examples from this book, Regret the Era, Error, uh, was a correction that they, that they uh, put out to their readers uh, describing, I believe you, um, Captain Noah Meyer, as a senior Hamas leader. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, so I've never had, had that. that well, what your reaction was to, what is to that. Um, my reaction is, whoa. Um, well, uh, my father has taught me that it doesn't matter what they say as long as they spell your name right, although I'm not sure I would say that about this. Um, I'm guessing that was not by, written by Zionists. Um, but uh, I was a spokesperson for the IDF, and I would love to see that and see if I can issue... A statement or something about that because that you threw me off guard there the, the Sacramento Bee did issue a correction oh they did so, okay so you are not a uh, senior Hamas leader I am not on the contrary you were no. you were the Israeli military spokesman I was the I was one of the I was a spokesperson for the North American press in the IDF a very proud one uh, no no engaging with Hamas I am I like to think myself a centrist and and at times maybe more liberal not to that extent, in any shape, way, or form. I don't talk to people who want to kill me and my family. <laughs> okay, well, very good. Well, th well thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay.